gospel. Let's come before him in prayer. Heavenly God, we thank you this morning for the privilege of what we have witnessed, how we have had the freedom to come and worship you. We thank you for your promises to us, and we pray that as we delve into your word this morning, that your spirit will again remind us of the truth, teach us the things that we need to know for our own good, and give us strength to live by your spirit and and for your glory every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in turning in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. We'll read verses 9 to 13. Mark 1, beginning at verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. That's John the Baptist. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love, With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. This is the word of God. Dear family of God, what's it like to hold a baby in your arms? Now, that probably depends on whose baby it is. Ask John and Cassie if they love holding little Heath in their arms, and I'm pretty sure the answer will be yes, almost every time. Now, ask a stranger to hold baby Heath, particularly when he's crying or when he's pooped and stinks, and you'll probably meet someone who is less than thrilled to hold this child. When Patsy and I were still kids, well, we were 23, but it seems like kids now, the Lord blessed us with our first baby. She's 30 now. We were living in a mobile home at Dort College. I would sometimes come home from class in the middle of the day, and Patsy would have just put Rachel down for a nap in a little cradle in our living room. I would see her laying there, Rachel, not Patsy, and pick her up and hold her tight. And as I was about to do that, Patsy would say, don't, she's sleeping. But I didn't listen. I just wanted to hold her, just for a minute. And then I'd put her back and she'd be asleep. I was so full of love for that kid. And in a way, it didn't make any sense. You see, by that point, I'd been an uncle 18 times. Little kids were nothing new to me. I'd held nephews and nieces many times, and I loved them all. I had fun with them. I enjoyed playing with them. Yet I never had the urge to snatch one of them out of the crib and squeeze them tight while they were sleeping. But they weren't my own. They belonged to my brothers and sisters, and somehow the love for my own child was automatically deeper. Now I think about that, as we read our text this morning and as we witness baptism. In our Bible reading, Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River, and a voice comes out of heaven. This is the voice of God the Father who says, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Another translation or paraphrase says, You are my wonderful Son. You make me very glad. Congregation, what child does not long to hear those words of love from his or her parent? We all want that. We all need that. And in God the Father, we have that. In Christ Jesus, we are given that gift of belonging to God and the assurance that he would stoop over our crib, that he would pick us up and he would cuddle us, and he would say to us, You are my child, whom I love. You make me very glad. Baptism is that reminder for us. Jesus' baptism is marked by several other things that are important. The first one that Mark mentions 
is in verse 10. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. The Greek word is schizo. We get schizophrenia from that. But schizo meaning ripped open, torn apart. Mark could have used a less violent word, like just open, a noigo, but he goes with torn or ripped open. And the opening of heaven occurs in the Old Testament. At the calling of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 1, we read, The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Heaven opening is usually a sign that God is about to speak or act, and that we will get a quick peek at God's purposes. However, Mark describes heaven being torn or ripped open, schizo, not just open. And that's significant. You see, if I open a door, I can close it again nicely. But if I rip the door open and tear it off its hinges, it's not going to be that easy to close it again. And Mark wants us to see that Jesus comes out of the water and all heaven breaks loose. Mark uses the verb again, schizo, near the end of his gospel to describe the temple curtain being torn in two from top to bottom at Jesus' death. These are instances where God breaks into the world, not smoothly, not calmly, he breaks in in new and powerful ways. The schizo of God is significant. In addition, we learn from the Old Testament that Joshua, Elijah, and Elisha each parted the Jordan River as a symbol of their God-given authority. However, Jesus is now shown by God to be one greater than the prophets of old. Jesus stands in the Jordan River, is baptized, and comes out of the water, and then heaven opens. Heaven is parted. Not just the Jordan River, heaven. As Bible scholar Don Jewell wrote it in the book Master of Surprise, the image may suggest that the protecting barriers are gone, and that God, unwilling to be, to be confined in sacred spaces, is on the loose in our own realm. This is not simply a picture of God being more accessible to us. This congregation is a picture of God coming into our lives, whether we want him to or not. Isaiah 64 verse 1 says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. And now at the baptism of Jesus, God comes. He breaks open the heavens, and he comes because his son has come to redeem the world. Heaven breaks forth so that the earth will take note. Taking note means we understand properly what's happening. Baptism is a sign of the covenant, as Pastor Michael so beautifully illustrated. That means it is God's sign to us. First of all, and primarily, it is that. There is a vow by parents, which we heard again this morning. There is a vow that says, I promise to raise my children in the fear of the Lord. And that vow sounds very similar to what you might hear in a church that simply dedicates infants. But what we must hear in baptism is God's vow to us. Not our vow to God, that's important, but God's vow to us is more important. God is the primary actor in baptism. God comes and he breaks through the wall of our sin and he says, I love you. I love you. And I embrace you. I call you mine. You see, baptism brings us back to the time when God made a covenant with Abraham to be a God to him and to his descendants after him. God put a mark of the covenant on his people. I can't say it strongly enough. We need God to make the first move in drawing us back into fellowship with him. We need God to make the first move in drawing us back into fellowship with him. That's what sin or what baptism signifies. God making the first move, it's a sign of God's love. It's a sign of a new reality bursting into a world of sin, an old world God has broken into our world in the person of Jesus. 
By God's grace, we now see ourselves the way God sees us, with the same eyes with which he sees his own son. Theologian N.T. Wright says, when the living God looks at us, at every baptized and believing Christian, he says to us what he said to Jesus on, the, on that day. He sees us, not as we see ourselves, but as we are in Jesus Christ. It sometimes seems impossible, especially to people who have never heard or had this kind of support from their earthly parents. But it's true. God looks at us and he says, You are my dear child. I'm delighted with you. Maybe listen to that again this morning and insert your own name and reflect quietly on God saying that to you both at your baptism and today, every day since. You, Kim, you, Margaret, you, Rhea, you, Julie, you, Sam, you, Heath, you, Craig, you, John, you. I'm delighted in you. I love you. God tears open heaven to come to us with a new reality. He's not content to leave us in doubt about how he feels about us. He wants us to know the lengths he'll go to love us. He'll rip open heaven. He'll send his own son. He'll mark us with the same sign of the covenant with which he marked his own beloved son so that we can all know God is for us. Our world doesn't give us that feeling that it's for us. It constantly tears us down. It grinds us down. All we often hear in our minds here is how we don't measure up. Rather than hearing doors being opened in love, we hear them slammed in our face. I was listening to a man who grew up with a very abusive mother. For years, he lived under her oppression, and he hated her. He hated her. His identity was wrapped up in hating this woman who had treated him so badly. He loved his dad, and he wanted to be labeled dad's boy, but his mom took him away from his dad even, made him hate her all the more. He wanted to be daddy's boy, but not mom's son. And that led to a very conflicted sense of identity. But it was healed when he allowed God to help him forgive his mom and to find his identity in Christ as a child of God. A beloved child. God doesn't look at the labels we put on people or that we allow people to put on us or that we even put on ourselves. He looks at the head of the covenant, Jesus Christ, his son, who is marked with his sign of the covenant. And he looks at all those in the covenant family marked with that same sign, and he sees us through Christ-colored glasses, as it were, and he calls us his sons and daughters anointed by the Holy Spirit finding our identity in God, in Christ. Any other label that is hung on us is incomplete or completely wrong. What we need to remember is that we are children of God, loved by God because of Jesus. Secondly, since we are God's, we are anointed and set apart for God's purposes in this world. And baptism signifies that too. We are equipped for service. Baptism reminds us that we are empowered by God to fulfill our purposes, His purposes in us, no matter where we are, no matter what we've been told we are, no matter who we think we are. We've got to remember we are God's children and equipped by God. The interesting thing about our Bible reading is getting to verse 12, where we read, after Jesus baptized, at once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, or more literally, at once the Spirit pushed him out into the desert. And he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with wild animals, and angels waited on or attended him. Sounds rather harsh to 
to think that the Spirit of God would push Jesus into the desert. But that's what the Holy Spirit does sometimes, isn't it? In love, he pushes us where God needs us. He pushes us into places where we will grow stronger in greater dependence upon God and on his grace. We don't always like it at the time, but we realize later that the Lord was at work in us. We needed a push. We even say that sometimes. I needed the push. We grew through a new challenge. If the Lord Jesus needed to be pushed into the wilderness, how much more don't we need the push? We need a nudge, sent in love, to get us to the place where God is shaping us, where God is challenging us, where God is sometimes refining us and growing us in the faith and in the joy that was ours in Christ as we learn to trust and obey. Sometimes the Spirit pushes us by bringing someone into our church, a new person. Sometimes a son or daughter brings home a friend or a potential spouse who stretches us. Sometimes it's a challenge that comes at work or at sports or what other place. Something that can really annoy you for a while. It could be a class at school or a, a new school or a new teacher or a new student. We get pushed into new places and situations that we would not think to choose because it brings stress or it just changes things in our lives that we don't want changed. But the promise of God in baptism for his covenant people is that he doesn't abandon us when he pushes us. Just think about what he says and what we see in the Bible reading that we, we see where Jesus is baptized. We see in the text, not only is Jesus pushed, but he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with wild animals and angels attended him. That's a very interesting mix of things, isn't it? And what we learn there is that God only puts us into difficult situations for a season. It could be a short time, it could be a longer time. But 40 days is code in the Bible for a full amount of time, whatever it might be. Just the right length for God to accomplish in our lives what he has in mind. Just the right amount. When Henny sent out the bulletin to everyone on Friday, it was still snowing, probably about 20 centimeters at that point. So she included this funny graphic. This funny graphic. There you go. Just happens. A man shoveling enough already into the snow. He's presumably doing that so that God can read it, I think. And it's true that sometimes we feel like that, isn't it? We want to tell God, we've had enough already, God. Enough struggles, enough challenges, enough sharpening or chiseling, whatever you're doing, it's enough. But only God knows when enough is truly enough because he's the one who's doing something new and good in our lives. It could be refining, strengthening, stretching, or anything else. He's up to something good so that we can be of greater service in his kingdom as we live our lives in the midst of the world. Maybe it was through being labeled in a certain way that we came to see our real identity in Christ. And now we can help other people see what we now see of Christ's love and power. God works through all the things that you and I go through even and especially the tough stuff that we find very hard and we want to say, enough! In addition, we see that Jesus was tempted by Satan. And we are, too. The word tempt is the same as the word test in the Greek. God does not tempt us, but he lets Satan come and tempt us. And that serves in God's providence to test us as well. And tests are always about making us better, stronger, more productive citizens in the kingdom of God. Similarly, the reference to wild animals helps us see that these can be scary experiences. No doubt about it. But then comes that final line, and angels attended him. 
or angels waited on you. That signals to us that hardships can bend us. They can drive us to the point of saying, enough already. But they can't ultimately break us. Satan can tempt us, and we can be frightened during this time. But God has even his guardian angels in place to get us through, to uphold us, to encourage us, to protect us, or even to open our eyes to see what God is doing. It all works, however, to make us more effective servants in the kingdom of God. And that's where we will find greater joy, the greatest joy possible, and the wonderful peace that is ours in Christ in this life. Look again at Jesus in our text. When he came out of the desert, he was equipped, equipped for service. Some say the road Jesus must tread precisely because he is God's dear son is the road that leads through the dry and dusty paths through temptation and apparent attacks and failure. It was that way for Israel, if you remember. They came out of Egypt after 400 years in bondage only to face 40 years in the desert. But when she came out, she was refined pushed into the promised land in the service of God and his kingdom. So it often is in our lives as well. Think back to the guy I mentioned who earlier had a very abusive, who I mentioned had a very abusive mother. Again, if we start the journey imagining that God is a bully, an angry, threatening parent ready to yell at us, slam the door on us, or kick us out on the street because we haven't quite made the grade we will fail at the first whisper of temptation. But if we remember the voice that spoke the powerful words of love, you are my dearly loved child, we'll find the way through by God's grace. God will get us through. Baptism is God's way of saying, I'll always, always be there for you. So when you go through trials, God is saying, look at me. Look for me. I broke open heaven for you to be my dear child. I'm for you today and for you always. God has given us in baptism a sign of his promise to be with us always and to be faithful. When we wake up in the morning, friends, we need to remind ourselves that we are not people who live under the power of or rather the bondage of Satan and all the labels that we've been given in our world. No, we are labeled as God's sons and daughters. We are marked with his sign, which is a reminder that the Holy Spirit lives in us. God lives in us. We are not helpless. We are not hopeless. We are not weak. We are not unimportant. We belong to God. We have his power in us. We have his agenda before us. We do not belong to someone else. We do not belong to this world. We belong to God. And no matter what you go through, no matter where you go wrong, no matter what label anyone else puts on you, remember your baptism and your identity in Christ. God says, you're my beloved child. I love you. I've labeled you dearly loved child of the covenant. That's you. Now live out of that promise and that comforting identity. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.